Welcome back. Well, we're going to finish out this week talking about the evolution of reptiles. So I'm going to kill my camera so we can get started on the lectures. So when we're thinking about reptiles, remember they arose from those later tetrapods, those anthracosaurs, and became adapted to land. And when we think about early reptiles, they developed an increasingly stronger skeletal st structure, more developed muscles. We see for the first time scales and lungs and limbs for increased motion, breathing atmospheric oxygen, tremendous increases in brain size for hunting. All this started to occur around 320 to 310 million years ago in the Carboniferous within the Paleozoic era. Now, when you think about this increasingly keratinized skin, this was effectively reducing the cutaneous uh, respiration that we primarily see in amphibians, leading to a far more effective means of respiration through pulmonary respiration or breathing atmospheric oxygen. This allowed for an increase in the size and the partitioning of the reptilian lung. But probably the most fundamental characteristic that reptiles possess over their amphibian counterparts is the presence of the amniotic egg, which allowed them to no longer rely on water for reproduction. So that's really, really important distinction between those evolution of reptile lineages versus our amphibian lineages. So if we think about our amphibian, uh, the evolution of amphibian lecture that we gave during the first day of uh, herpetology class, Remember, we really focused on about 340, 350 million years ago, these sarcopogenean lobed fin fishes and how they gave rise to our tetrapods. And we focused largely on the amphibian lineages that you see on this, and we stopped right here with the amniota. And remember, the Carboniferous period is where we started to see this early divergence from that group that's going to be ultimately leading to our reptiles. Uh, versus that started in the Carboniferous and really proliferated in the Permian. And remember the Permian was that period that really started to undergo those area, the arid transition. So it got really droughty, got hot, got dry. And given the characteristics that we just talked about, skin tough covered with scales, well-developed lungs, a shelled egg, all of those things allowed reptiles to incredibly diversify in the Permian. So here's the phylogeny of our reptiles, and it's far more complicated than we see with our amphibians, uh, largely because we have a much better fossil record. If you think about a lot of our reptiles, again, they have larger bodies, more developed skeletal systems. If you have a more developed and, and larger skeletal system, it's easier to find in the fossil record than some of our smaller uh, amphibian counterparts. So again, this is our cladogram showing the phylogenetic origins of reptiles. So we're starting on these stem amniotes. So we're starting right here in the Permian, which began to diverge in the Carboniferous. So here we are in a Carboniferous where we're starting to diverge. And we really want to focus on that particular period of time. And I want to focus on the synapsids, the diapsids, and the anapsids. So let's first focus on the synapsids and these archosaurians. This is the branch that, that branched early on from that amphibian line and quickly became completely terrestrial with the development of a shelled and amniotic egg. So the synapsids largely became our modern day mammals. So we're not gonna spend hardly any time talking about the synapsids. When you have Dr. Zollner in the spring semester, at the beginning of the spring semester, He's going to spend all of his time talking about synapses. So he's, he might be picking up right about here, but we're not going to focus on that so he can cover it in his class. We're going to spend a lot of time focused on the diapsids. So if we're thinking about the diapsids, there's really two large groups that I want us to focus on, and those are the archosaurians and the lepidosaurs. So within the diabs, diapsids, Archosaurians, lepidosaurs. The archosaurs are the ones that eventually gave rise to our modern day birds, gave rise to our modern day crocodilians, and largely was responsible 
or the dinosaurs. Right, so here's this large cluster of the dinosaurs, and you can see they existed all the way up through the Cretaceous 65 million years ago, and then all of those lineages stopped. Whereas the modern day birds obviously continued on, and our modern day crocodilians continued on. That's with the Archosaurian lineage, sublineage within the diapsids. Within the diapsids, if we look at the lepidosaurs, you can see they gave rise, particularly in the Jurassic, to the origin of our modern day snakes, the origin of our modern day lizards. And it's not until we get to the anapsids, which gave rise to our modern day turtles. Okay, so those are the large groupings that I want us to be thinking about with regard to uh, reptile evolution. So let's go through just a few of the early reptile fossils that are of note. And let's start talking about the early Carboniferous about 340 million years ago. So these early reptiles were first to develop this terrestrially adapted egg or cladoic egg or shelled egg. Uh, these early reptiles resembled small lizards and evolved from those Fimian amphibians about 340 million years ago. Again, the shelled egg is the, probably the most important evolutionary milestone since it allowed eggs to survive out of water and branch out into more drier, more arid environments. If we look at Caesonaria, that had a mix of both reptile and amphibian characteristics, placing it either at or very near the beginning of amniotes. So it has a salamander-like early tetrapod, which has a salamander-like head, but it has claws, which is not an amphibian characteristic. Um, and again, it's the first amniote, which leads us to believe it may be, again, that transition or very early uh, ancestor to all subsequent amniotes. And again, these amniotes allowed eggs to survive out of water and disperse onto drier land. So if we look back 315 million years ago, we find our earliest known reptile, and it's known as Hylonomus. It's among the first amniotes. It is an anabid, small, lizard-like. And this fossil has very distinct toes, very distinct scales and claws. And we think that it has an insectivorous diet, numerous sharp teeth in the upper and lower mandibles of this particular fossil. If we think about the, the Mesozoic age, this is the age of reptiles. We see an explosive radiation of reptiles representing some of the most numerous and the largest reptiles that ever roamed the earth. They were in fact the dominant reptiles, uh, both terrestrial and aerial environments, also really formidable marine predators as well. But again, they stopped right about 65 million years ago at the end of the Cretaceous. Now those, all those lineages no longer exist. What still does exist are the archosauriomorphs, uh, particularly the branches that lead to the crocodilians and the, the bird lineages. So if we think about some of the fossils from the early crocodilians, again, these are our surviving archosaurs. Some of the earliest ancestors reach back from the Jurassic to the mid Cretaceous. And some of these crocodilians are ginormous. So if we look at Stomatosuchus, we have 36 foot long that lived in the swamps of North Africa, which is still dwarfed next to Sarcosuchus, which is the flesh crocodile, which reached lengths of up to 40 feet in length. And Sarcosuchus is oftentimes known as the super croc. And of course we have a uh, a handful of crocodilians that, of the, again, these surviving archosaurs that still exist today, America crocodile and American alligator here in the United States. If we focus on the Lepidosauromorphs, this is that second major diapsid lineages, which gives rise to our lizards, snakes, and of course our tuatara. If you think about the tuatara, it is a spinodontia. It's in its own order. It's essentially a living fossil that descended from the beak-headed reptiles, rhinocephalia. Now, what's really interesting about the tuatara is they're completely endemic to the small island of New Zealand off the south coast of uh, Australia. Now, with regard to turtles, the anapsids, we have a pretty good fossil record, which makes sense because they have these really bony carapace, a really bony plastron, and their body plans haven't really changed over the last couple of hundred million years. So by the late Triassic, the basic bottle, turtle body plan had evolved and remained unchanged for millions of years. 
By the middle Cretaceous, the fresh marine turtles tended to appear, having these really streamlined shells, flipper forelimbs. Uh, there is some controversy at this point of the placement of turtles. They're now wondering if they should be placed in, in diapsids versus anapsids, but until that's resolved, we're gonna keep the turtles for the purposes of our class in the anapsid lineage. So let's talk about some of these uh, early fossil records for our anapsids. And let's focus on the late Triassic about 220 million years ago. And we're gonna focus on Odontocles. So this was a shallow water fossil from East Asia. It was discovered in 2008. And it actually predated the earliest known turtle by about 10 million years. And it was, uh, had a fully formed shell, a relatively small shell, around 16 inches long. And it had a tooth beak. If you think about all the extant turtles, they have an upper and lower beak with no teeth. Whereas this really early Ondontocles had teeth prominently pr present in both the upper and lower jaw. And it was also known as the toothed shell. And you can see how it has these protrusions that resemble teeth on the shell as well. Again, a very early fossil record on Dantocles. 10 million years later, we have Proganocles. This is a, probably the most well-known early turtle and starts to show even 210 million years ago, very much similar in appearance to our modern day turtles. Whereas this is sort of a transition, it has a very few teeth in the upper and lower beak, whereas modern turtles again have none. This one, with, uh, it lacks those teeth on the shell that we saw with Odontocles. So again, with just, just 10 million years of evolution, we're starting to see characteristics of our modern day turtles. So fast forward to 165 million years where you get to Elianocles. And this is our earliest pond turtle also discovered in 2008, which has many, many of the characteristics that we see on almost all of our present day, especially our pond turtles and the family amenity, which we're gonna learn about in the very next lecture. And the last one I wanna leave you with is Archelon, which is Greek for ruling turtle. Uh, this particular fossil was uh, discovered in South Dakota and Wyoming. It was, it's documented to be 12 feet long and weigh two tons. This is the largest turtle ever on record. It's a pre the largest prehistoric, prehistoric turtle that has ever lived. It's had unusually large flipper-like arms and legs. Its closest living relative uh, that's extant today is probably our leatherback sea turtle. So I, I didn't go into great detail on a lot of the different fossils because there are entire classes here at Purdue focused largely on dinosaurs. So we're not gonna spend a whole lot of time talking about the fossil record of that particular lineage group. Instead, we're gonna now start moving into the extant lineages of, of all reptiles, and including our, our snakes, lizards, and turtles. So that's where I'm gonna to end today. And so this is a pretty short lecture, largely because there are other classes on campus that really focus on the very, very broad overview that I gave you with regard to reptilian evolution. But really the take home points for you are thinking about those synapsid lineages, the diapsid lineages, as well as the anapsid lineages, when they occurred, what eras, what period, and when we saw those major um, evolutionary diversity occur in, in, in that period of time. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and stop there. And the next time we talk, we'll be talking about our extant reptiles.